What's your favorite donut and why? My favorite is the maple bar. It's not so sweet, it's caramel, they're soft. It's just one of my favorite things, the all-time, all-time favorite. The donut shop business is Susan Lim's life. Her Orange County, California donut shop is just one of many that sprinkle the U.S. Combined, those stores and producers make 10 billion donuts annually. Every single donut I would took a bite and I would throw away, I took a bite, because I want to see the flavor of it, each and every one of them. Baked into the backstory of this shop's glazed, dipped, and twisted pastries is a detailed and sometimes painful history about Cambodian refugees. See, this donut shop isn't just Lim's life. It also gave her family a new chance at life after fleeing war-torn Cambodia in the 1970s. My mother's story makes me feel really proud and honestly very empowered. My family's background is so rich and so, like, straight out of a movie. Like, these things are, don't happen to everyday people. Lim's experience is only one of many similar stories from Cambodian refugees who settled in Southern California and then opened donut shops as a way to survive and thrive in the U.S. Hey fam, I'm Imayan, and this Sunday, we're actually doing a story that you guys pitched to us. We're looking at why there are so many Cambodian-owned donut shops in Southern California. Amanda. Susan Lim says donuts have been very sweet to her. Definitely American dreams to have a business. It's American dream just to do anything here. I mean, America is definitely opened up doors to uh, many refugees like myself. Lim bought this donut shop from her parents after they retired in 2004. She'd spent years learning up close about the family's business because she started working in it as a teenager. But before her family acquired more than a dozen donut shops in Southern California, they were literally just trying to survive. When you talk about things like that, it kind of brings back memories. Um, the suffering, the starving. Lim's native Cambodia was thrust into war when communist and anti-communist forces battled for the nation's post-colonial future, according to Richard Kim. The war was actually an extension of the Vietnam War, which consumed Indochina. All of it rolled up into the Cold War, which was an ideological struggle about the spread of communism. The brutal war lasted for most of the 1970s, but the conditions that ignited it had been years in the making. It's um, the result of, of decades of colonial rule under the French and the power vacuum that was left with uh, the, the ousting of the king in 1970. Um, power struggles emerged over who had the right to rule Cambodia. Kim says the U.S. wasn't allowed to step foot in Cambodia because it had been declared neutral ground. Instead, the United States conducted an aerial bombing campaign that failed in its objective to destroy the supply line that was the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The bombing killed Cambodians and devastated the land. This bombing devastated Cambodia and Laos, and this is probably one reason also why the Khmer Rouge were able to mobilize support from the peasants in Cambodia to win the Civil War because many of them uh, turned to more radical ideology as a result of, of the massive bombing. Khmer Rouge would go on to rule Cambodia with torturous tactics and cruelty, including what's become known as the Cambodian killing fields. They were sites where people were murdered, sometimes clubbed to death to save bullets. And a key moment during the war was when the Khmer Rouge conquered the capital city of Phnom Penh in 1975. They basically tried to exterminate the educated class. And Lim says her father was one of the people who was targeted. Here's how he managed to escape a deadly fate. My parents survived by pretending to be, to be dummy, to be not educated, to be a farmers, not educators, not teachers. That's why they left them alone and not not kill them. Her parents used their home as a haven for their children during the war. The Lim kids couldn't go to school. Life was just about surviving the daily stressors of war. I still remember a little bit about it, being hungry, being starving, no food, um, no water. I honestly don't know how we survived during the war. You have to want to live in order to survive. You have to fight. It's not a matter of choice. In 1979, the family decided to try and escape the horrors surrounding them. Lim was only 12 years old. Like other families, the Lims paid a man to help guide them to Thailand's border. 
Lim's family walked for four days and three nights amid bombing remnants, alongside hundreds of others seeking reprieve and refuge. They really didn't take much. I mean, we only brought maybe a few clothes to change, um, some food, a little bit of money. Um, there's not much to carry because there's so many people trying to get out of the city on foot, no cars. We basically walk miles and miles and miles. Her family made it out to a refugee camp in Thailand, but many others wouldn't or couldn't. Lim's infant brother is among the war's casualties. He essentially starved to death. Cambodian civil war would kill at least 1.5 million people, but the real toll could be up to 2 million. And even the bit of freedom Lim found in the refugee camp wasn't a break from her suffering. In some ways, it was a reminder of what she and her family had lost and lacked. They were watching this lady bought candy for her children. And my mom looks at me and she couldn't afford it. And I just feel bad for my brother, so. Lim's family spent a few months in the Thai refugee camp before her uncle Ted Nguoi sponsored them to come to the U.S. That's how she ended up here in Southern California. She says her family was among the earliest Cambodian refugees to the region. Lim didn't speak English and the transition was difficult. America is like, where is America, you know? Didn't know where and when we got to LAX, it was so weird, it's like, you know, um, big tall people, white people. It's like, you know, you never seen white people. <laughs> Her family arrived to an America deeply divided about accepting refugees. One Harris poll taken in May 1975 found that 37% of Americans were in favor of accepting the refugees, 49% opposed it, and 14% weren't sure. Even President Jimmy Carter essentially refused entry to 40,000 Cambodian refugees before later taking a more humane approach to the conflict's victims. This was America's climate when Lynn's family moved in with her uncle and began working at his donut shop. My uncle is, um, he's the king of the donut. His name is Ted Ngoi. Ngoi employed Lim's parents, teaching them the trade. In fact, the very first night Lim's family arrived in California, Ngoi took her parents to make donuts with him. Without him helping us, recruiting us, I, I don't know where most Cambodians would be doing, including my family. Nagoy continued to sponsor other Cambodian refugees, hiring them, teaching them about the donut shop business. The many Cambodians who own donut shops are Nagoy's legacy, as are the pink boxes that have become synonymous with Southern California stores. Lim's daughter, Amanda Lim Tang, says her great uncle chose the pink boxes because they were the least expensive alternative. I honestly could see myself running this, and I would hate for this to not be a part of people's lives anymore. Tang is running parallel to her grandparents' path. They worked for Nagoya for three to five years before eventually saving enough money to buy their own store. That store became two, and then three, and eventually more than a dozen. Susan Lim says her family story is an example of the American dream. She hopes at least one of her five children will one day join the business, but only after getting a college education, which she says she wasn't able to do because she had to help her family. Susan Lim's family is just one of more than two million people who fled the region between the 1970s and the 1990s. The United States took in more than 1.52 million of them. Some of the refugees landed here in Long Beach, California, in a place that's today known as Cambodia Town. It's filled with businesses owned by Cambodians. And now some of the refugees who arrived as children or who were born in refugee camps are being repatriated to a nation they've never really known. The US and Cambodia signed a memorandum in 2002 saying an average of 35 people would be deported annually. And that was true until 2016. That's when the Cambodian government told the U.S. Embassy in Phnom Penh that it would no longer accept deportees until it had a chance to review the issue. The agreement allows the U.S. to repatriate Cambodians who've committed a crime, even if that crime is a misdemeanor, and even if they're married to U.S. citizens. By 2017, more than 500 Cambodians have been deported as part of the agreement. And in the first week of April 2018, the U.S. deported the largest group of Cambodians ever. Immigration officials sent back more than 40 people to Cambodia. Lim says she doesn't personally know anyone who's been affected by the deportations. And what she wants is the legacy of Cambodian donut shop owners to continue. What I like most about working here is meeting my customers, my clients, um, talk to them. Um, wait on them, make them happy. That's why I'm here.
Hi, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And this story proves we actually do read the comments section. So give us your story ideas below, and we'll look for you next Sunday.